Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. second book of kings. Naaman, a general for the king of Aram, was a great man and highly regarded by his master, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. This man was a mighty warrior, but he had a skin disease. Now Aramean raiding parties had gone out and captured a young girl from the land of Israel. She served in Naaman's life. A wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master could come before the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he ripped his clothes. He said, what? Am I God to hand out death and life? But this king writes me asking me to cure someone of his skin disease. You must realize that he wants to start a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that Israel's king had ripped his clothes, he sent word to the king. Why did you rip your clothes? Let the man come to me. Then he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. Naaman arrived with his horses and chariots. He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent out a messenger who said, go and wash seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and become clean. But Naaman went away in anger. 
He said, I thought for sure that he'd come out, stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the bad spot and cure the skin disease. Aren't the rivers in Damascus, the Abana and the Farpar better than all Israel's waters? Couldn't I wash in them and get clean? So he turned away and proceeded to leave in anger. Naaman's servants came up to him and said, spoke to him. Our father, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All he said to you was wash and become clean. So Naaman went down and bathed in the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God had said. His skin was restored like that of a young boy, and he became clean. He returned to the man of God with all his attendants. He came and stood before Elisha saying, now I know for certain that there's no God anywhere on earth except in Israel. Please accept the gift <coughs> from your servant. <coughs> the word of the Lord. Thanks. Our psalm today is Psalm 111. Let's read it responsibly by whole verse. Hallelujah, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are saved by all who delight in him. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works and given them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. A reading from the second letter to Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead and descended from David. This is my good news. This is the reason I'm suffering to the point that I'm in prison like a common criminal. But God's word cannot be imprisoned. This is why I endure everything for the sake of those who are chosen by God, so that they too may experience salvation in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This saying is reliable. If we have died together, we will also live together. If we endure, we will also rule together. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are disloyal, he stays faithful because he can't be anything else than what he is. Remind them of these things and warn them in the sight of God not to engage in battles over words that aren't helpful and only destroy those who hear them. Make an effort to present yourself to God as a tried and true worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, but is one who interprets the message of truth correctly. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, God. We will sing, we will sing this four times in English. <laughs> Thank you. 
The Holy Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, weren't ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, get up and go. Your faith has healed you. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Earlier this week, the following story came across my Facebook feed. You may have seen it at some point in the past as well. Story. Years ago, anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected me to talk about fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones. But no, Mead said that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was a femur, a thigh bone that had been broken and then healed. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger get to the river for a drink or hunt for food. You are meat for prowling beasts. No animal survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. A broken femur that has been healed is evidence that someone has taken time to stay with the one who fell, has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts, Mead said. We are our best when we serve others, be civilized. By the way, there are multiple references to this story. Just do a search on Mead and Femur. I read the story and nodded my head. Wow, that's cool. But when I see something like this come across social media, especially if I think I might, it might be useful in a sermon, I want to ensure I get the proper original source, even though we know everything on Facebook is true. <laughs> so I did a little background check. There's a problem. Even though the story was quoted in many places, including Forbes magazine, there is no clear evidence that she ever had this conversation. The story has been around for quite some time, but there is no direct citation to Mead, even when the account first appeared in a 1980s book entitled Fearfully and Wonderfully Made by Christian authors Paul Brand and Philip Yancey. It recently reappeared with vigor during the pandemic. Hmm. By the way, it's also not true that only humans tend to their broken or ill kin. There's enough evidence in the non-human animal kingdom to argue that chimps, elephants, or wolves are civilized. All that hard evidence aside about its factual basis, it is a cool story. It's a story that, as I mentioned, reemerged during the initial months of the pandemic. Why? Well, I can't authoritatively say I wasn't the one who retold the story, but I can imagine that it was recounted perhaps to encourage us 
to take care of those who are suffering from COVID. And maybe to encourage us to wear masks, the signs that we were civilized. Again, I don't know precisely why that Margaret Mead story was told and then retold in business journals as well as the internet. But I can't imagine that it is heard in much the same way as I heard it this week. That's a great story about how we are meant to behave as civilized, ethical people. It's a story devoid of politics that appeals to our better natures, to what we want to believe about ourselves, about who we are called to be as humans living in a community. It is a good secular story. It tells the same, lost my place, tells the same, emphasizes the same truth that we as Christians love to hear and need to demonstrate, think Good Samaritan. It is at its core, the same story that we heard this morning in our readings from 2 Kings about Elisha and Luke about Jesus. Most of the stories about Elisha, with different particulars, of course, contain similar themes. Often what we see are actions that save Elisha's marginalized followers from material distress. We read that he purifies a vital spring, making water palatable for Jericho's residents. He increases a widow's supply of oil so that she won't lose her children to a creditor. He promises a son to a Shunammite woman, and then when that son dies, he revives him and restores him to his mother. He neutralizes a poison in a stew so that his disciples can eat during a famine. He multiplies 20 loaves of bread in order to feed 100 people. And as we heard today, he heals the Syrian general Naaman of a skin disease. Aside from these miracles, Elisha was considered a prophet. He inherited that role, that mantle, from Elijah, another prophet. And a number of other stories about him show him continuing Elijah's commission in being engaged in the affairs of the politics of the day. We don't see, however, in the accounts of Elisha, any predictions about what is going to happen in the future. We hardly see any critiques of the current situation. Both of those characteristics of a prophet we have come to expect. No, we see a prophet who simply acted on behalf of God, Elisha like any prophet, was an agent transmitting God's will. In the story we heard this morning in particular, we witness a great extension of Elisha's transmission of God's will beyond the immediate cares of God's own people. Naaman, a Syrian general, suffered from some kind of skin disease. It was a serious matter. He could have been seen as polluting those around him. He sought to be cured. An Israelite slave girl referred him to Elisha, an Israelite man of God. Through his interaction with Elisha, he was made clean. Not only was Naaman physically cured or made whole, his relationship was restored with his community, secular and religious. We read a few verses later that Naaman expects to be allowed back into the temple of the Syrian god Rimen. Elisha, the Israelite prophet, an agent of the transmission of God's will, demonstrates that God's will for the healing of an individual, as well as the healing of relationships, wasn't confined to a special people. Likewise, Jesus' actions with the ten lepers, as they're often called, demonstrate the same quality or character of a prophet as an agent of the transmission of God's will for individual and communal wholeness. While the precise geography of the story is a bit hazy, Luke, the only evangelist who tells this story, clearly places the encounter in a location where Jews and Samaritans were in close proximity. While, as with Naaman, we doubt that the men suffered from Hansen's disease, we can tell that their condition was one that exiled them from their homes. Jesus apparently didn't care where the man originated. He promised all of them 
that they would be healed. God's desire for wholeness is universal. And he told them to, quote, show themselves to the priests, that is, do what was necessary to be restored to their individual communities. The promised healing was twofold. Individual health, as well as communal health. What's a bit different in this story, and perfectly in line with Luke's overall emphasis on the availability of Jesus's message to non-Jews, is how the Samaritan fits in. Yes, at a junction point between Samaria and Galilee, Jewish and Samaritan lepers would have created a common community. But with their cure, the Jewish lepers, once they were showed themselves to the priests, would have been cured and allowed to rejoin their original community. The Samaritan would not have needed the Jewish priests. So while he may have been restored to his Samaritan home, his prostration at Jesus' feet, especially as Luke tells the story, suggests that he has found a more profound priest as well. And a new radically inclusive community, the Jesus way. Elisha and Jesus, both as prophets, in their own ways and contexts, communicated God's will, wholeness for individuals and wholeness within communities. The stories about Elisha were centuries old before being recorded and are subject to elaboration and editorial comment. We weren't there. The account of Jesus and the 10 lepers, told only by Luke, may or may not have happened exactly as recorded, we don't know. In that regard, both stories bear similar levels of factual uncertainty, as does the Margaret Mead femur civilization story. But I would argue they all, religious and secular stories, tell the capital T truth. God wishes us to be whole individuals. That is the root meaning of salvation, after all. God's will for us is to be healed and by extension to be prophets, agents of the transmission of God's will for healing to others and to create healthy, life-giving and sustaining communities. And so the significant question to us is how? As constantly being healed individuals, as members of a constantly being healed community, can we extend God's ministry in a world of lepers seeking wholeness and welcome? Continue our worship with the Nicene Creed to stand as you are able. <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, from God, light from light. True, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Great are the deeds of the Lord. Beloved in Christ, let us pray, saying, Christ, hear our prayer. Jesus, have mercy on us. May your church be faithful, even as you are faithful. May we and your whole church unashamedly work to further the gospel. May we overcome whatever apathy or distraction might threaten our witness. We pray especially for those who lead our church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Kim, our bishop, Gary, our rector, and Nadine, our deacon. Christ, hear our prayer. Jesus, have mercy on us. May the nations of the world seek wisdom and truth. May people, rich and poor, powerful and weak, find in you the source of healing and wholeness. We pray especially for our nation's civic leaders, for Joseph, our president, Jared, our governor, our legislative bodies and our courts. Christ, hear our prayer. Jesus, have mercy on us. May we protect and guard the created order. May we recognize the majesty and splendor of all you have made. May we remember that healthy waters, sky, and land make us healthier people. We pray especially for all the blessings and beauty you provide. Christ, hear our prayer. Jesus, have mercy on us. May we ever be compassionate toward those who are pushed into the margins of our society. Give us open hearts that welcome and open hands that touch. Teach us a love that crosses boundaries and borders. Christ, hear our prayer. Jesus, have mercy on us. May the sick and suffering know in their bodies and minds your healing power. You desire to make men and women clean of disease and stigma. Make your grace known. Through your son, Jesus, give comfort, heal and deliver your people, especially those we now name. Christ, hear our prayer. Jesus, have mercy on us. May those who have died know the salvation found in you, Christ Jesus. Preserve the living in enduring hope that just as we are baptized into your death, so we will also live with you forever. Christ, hear our prayer. Jesus, have mercy on us. As the diocese uh, engages in its annual convention later this week, the prayer for the church convention for the day. Almighty and ever living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in the Diocese of Colorado for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We are truly sorry and we don't do it again. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank <laughs> you.
Well, good morning again, everyone. Glad again to see you here after this service. Um, if you are in this room, please move on down the hall uh, for coffee in the parish hall. And then come on back at 9.15. If you're at home, go get coffee, come on back at 9.15 for the first of a two-part series on pilgrimage. Um, today, I will sort of give a little bit of background of pilgrimage and things like that. And then next week, same time, same place. Kurt and Melissa will talk about their pilgrimage on the Camino. Um, so this will sort of give a, a little bit of context for what they'll talk about next week. So it should be good both, both times. So please come back at 9.15. It will be Zoomed on the same, um, the same channel. You don't have to change anything. And if you can't uh, be here, it will be recorded and made available um, online. So you'll be able to see or hear the conversation, whether or not you're able to be here in person. Then in two weeks, we'll start, or in three weeks, I guess, um, 23rd, um, we'll start a series um, on the history of Good Shepherd. Um, and uh, we are fortunate that we still have folks um, in the congregation who were here when it was founded. And so to hear the stories coming out of their experience and their lives of how this church came to be and what brought us to where we are now is what we'll be doing for, for several weeks. And uh, Jim will be, has put together a variety of panels to, to do this, one for each week. And it will basically focus on the tenure of each of the four rectors as using those as periods of, of breaking things up. And then the last week, or the fifth week, which would be the week right before Thanksgiving, and you all have family around, uh, Mary Need is going to talk to us about how to collect oral histories. So if you uh, know that um, there is somebody that has significant stories about your family that um, you can't remember, but they can, how do you get those stories from them so that you can save them for um, those who come later? So Mary will talk to us about how to do oral histories. So all of that will lead us up um, to Thanksgiving. And after that, it's Advent and we've got something else planned for that. So that's what's going up in the next few weeks for, for Faith Forum. Should be, should be really, really good. Again, I invite you after this service into the parish hall for coffee. And again, on Tuesday afternoon, 5.30, uh, here in the chapel for Eucharist, midweek Eucharist. Are there birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate this morning? Any online? All right. Then let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor unto the Lord.
All things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, O Lord. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <clears throat> to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in your word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember, we remember his death, death. We proclaim his, his resurrection. resurrection. We await, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. But now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our okay. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep feast. 
Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Greg Bell will be taking communion to Laura Rodriguez. In the name of God, we send you forth to share communion with those who are absent from this table. Amen. Our prayers are with you. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. 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 